Hey gang, welcome to another exciting edition of Time in the Market, the investing channel with a long-term focus. Today, I'm going to take a look at Warner Brothers Discovery, ticker WBD. Uh, these guys are obviously in the entertainment space, uh, and they were formed when AT&T decided they wanted to get out of the entertainment business. Only three years after acquiring Warner Media, they did so by merging Warner Media with Discovery, and thus WBD was born. It started trading at around $25 in 2022, and it's down closer to 10 bucks right now, so quite a lot of value destruction there. Uh, one of the things that AT&T did was saddle WBD with a bunch of debt, and that has been a big overhang on this stock. And also the revenue growth just hasn't been there, and we'll take a look at that through this earnings presentation. If you look at the price that AT&T paid in 2018, it was $85 billion for Warner Media alone. Now you look at Warner Media plus Discovery trading an enterprise value of 70 billion, so you can kind of see where the stock has been headed. And Warner Media's history is really one of value destruction. You can all go back all the way to 2000 when AOL acquired Time Warner at the time for $183 billion. And just a year later, they were writing down a huge portion of the acquisition and announcing earnings of negative 99 billion. And they have sold off a variety of entities since then, sold off the cable business, and now this is just a media portion that is merged with discovery at the time um, so revenue story hasn't been good when you look at their presentation at time of merger their 2023 projections were close to 52 billion in overall revenue close to 13 to 14 billion in ebitda and then close to 15 billion in direct to consumer revenue and none of that has come to fruition based on what we're seeing as of q2 2023 projections have the stock closer to 43, 44 billion in revenue. So just a small eight to nine billion dollar miss off of their projections made just two years ago. Their EBITDA is going to be close to 10.5 to 11 billion. So, you know, just a three to four billion dollar miss or maybe two to three billion dollar miss, I guess. And their direct to consumer revenue is probably going to be just north of 10 billion. So quite a big miss on that front as well. The good thing and maybe a bad thing from the view of some fans of the HBO and the Warner Brothers family is that they did do a pretty good job of cutting costs, of eliminating costs, basically by slashing things as much as you can slash them. They canceled TV shows. They basically deleted TV shows from their platform. They canceled things that were already done. One of the biggest examples was the Catwoman movie that they spent $90 million on and basically just shelved it forever. And the idea behind that is to improve their balance sheet going forward, to take advantage of the fact that you can amortize the expenses when a merger happens really quickly instead of across multiple years as you would normally with content. So they made their net income look really bad uh, in the short term with the added benefit that it'll look slightly better in the long term. The good thing is that none of that really impacts their free cash flow because these are all non-cash expenses. But if you look at their net, net income in the last year or two, it just looks really bad, but the free cash flow is actually pretty, pretty solid. And that is very important when it comes to their main problem is their huge pile of debt that they have to work down in the next couple of years to maintain uh, th their ongoing entity status, essentially. They have so much debt, and the majority of their enterprise value at this point is due to their debt, and the market is valuing them when where they're valuing them because of that huge debt overhang. So clearly the results aren't good, uh, but they're going through a transformation right now. Uh, they're going through operational initiatives that are going to drive stronger financials, but those strong financials do have to eventually be supported by growing revenue, which just isn't happening right now. And that's certainly something that is being reflected in the price point as well. You can kind of see that, hey, some of those investments that we made and some of the cost cutting that we've gone through are already yielding results because the adjusted EBITDA are, you know, it's trending in the right direction. Uh, so they mainly function in three business areas. First, there's the studios. This is their TV production. They make and sell television shows, whether it's intercompany or externally. They do have a game studio. Don't know if this is really part of their long-term vision. For example, AT&T did sell their mobile studio Playdemic before the merger. So maybe this isn't something they really value that highly, or maybe AT&T was just a crappy steward of their, um, <laughs> their uh, assets, probably the latter but we'll see if this is something that they stick to. And then they make movies for theaters, et cetera. And they also have 
tours of their various studios. So this is a, a business that's relatively inconsistent quarter to quarter. So even though this is dropping 24%, part of that is just, hey, maybe they had a bigger games release in the prior quarter than they do now. They didn't have as many successful theatrical releases. And then also partially there's the strike, strike happening right now that might be coming to an end that is driving the ability to actually produce TV series and sell those to other companies. The nice thing with Warner Media and Warner in general is that they have a lot of this stuff in-house. They have their own studios, they have their own sound stages, they have their own clothing departments, etc. So that helps on the expense side as well, which makes these things a bit more profitable. They can make their movies internally from start to finish, whereas some other companies can't do that. For example, they are making TV shows for companies like Apple. They are making TV shows for companies like Netflix. So there's an additional revenue stream that those companies don't have. And when those companies try to bring some of that stuff in house, their expenses are higher because they don't have these actual sound stages, studios, et cetera. They're already pre-built within their business model. So that's a good thing. The bad thing is that these guys have had mediocre successes when it comes to some of their theatrical releases. Their DC slate has been kind of very mismanaged. They're trying to change that, bringing in new leadership, etc. But on the other side, obviously, they've had some successes when it comes to things like Barbie, which is the highest grossing movie this year and probably going to remain the highest grossing movie this year. So that offsets some of the real mismanagement on the uh, DC side and some of their other movies and the lack of hits there in. Um, so this is obviously going to change quarter over quarter, but in general, this is a, a relatively interesting business to be in. Obviously, if you think that movie theaters are dying and the theater experience is going down the drain, this is going to be a bit of a problem for them, but they are still making money on this side of the business and they always uh, do it both internally and externally, which is a bit different from some of the other players in this industry. Then you've got the network side. This is their TV channels, TBS, TNT, HDTV, etc. from the Discovery family. They also own a bunch of TV channels overseas. And the way this model essentially works is that they get a rate from distributors that then include their channels and a bunch of cable packages that they sell to people, right? So this is pay TV subscriptions. On top of that, their channels sell advertising to advertisers uh, and make money off of that. Obviously, the expense side of things are the management of the TV channels themselves, paying for sports rights, paying for television programming to be on those channels, etc. And that's one of the risks here on the sports side of things, especially is that content costs could go up. Um, and if the revenue keeps sliding downwards, that's going to impact their ability to actually monetize this cash cow because this is their cash cow for now. Even though pay TV subscriptions are declining, more people are cutting the cord and rate increases aren't keeping up and advertising revenue for now at least is going down because of macro conditions in the United States and international markets, costs could continue to go up. They do have the NBA um, rights negotiation coming up in 2024 that might cause them to spend more money on that or even lose those rights which which may mean negative things for their ability to keep uh increasing their rate when it comes to distributors and on top of that people are just cutting the cost in general because there's other alternatives on the direct to consumer side so that's something to keep in mind as you look at this business right now this is a cash cow what does it look like five to ten years from now because the revenue is obviously shrinking as more people cut the cord the Free cash flow and EBITDA is obviously shrinking as more people cut the cord and operating expenses potentially go up as costs uh, and sports rights go up in value. Um, now, on the opposite end here, even though the revenue on the pay TV side is shrinking uh, and EBITDA is shrinking as well, the offset to that would be the direct to consumer product that they have, whether it's Max or Discovery Plus or whatever they may release in the future. Actually, they used to own Crunchyroll before AT&T sold them before the merger. I kind of wish they kept that. It's just another just direct-to-consumer product that they could have monetized, potentially made money off of. That one mainly deals with anime versus some of the other stuff that they deal with already. So Max and Discovery Plus have kind of merged at this point. That's their main product. It's Max. Um, the problem is that growth there has kind of stalled out. You can kind of see that direct-to-consumer subscribers are 95.8 million down from you know, close to 97 million, 98 million in Q1 2023. So they actually lost 1.8 million subscribers year over year. Their revenue is actually up because their advertising was slightly better because they added an ad supported tier. Um, and they also started licensing more of their content to other players during this period as well. However, if their revenue on the pay TV side is going down, 
they have to make it up on the direct consumer side. And if growth there is plateauing already or kind of slowing, that is a bit of a problem. They can certainly increase the rate that they're charging consumers. You know, right now their HBO Max or I guess Max fee is $15.99 up from $14.99 not too long ago. So they have the pricing power to increase that. But how high can they take it? Uh, and how will that, how much losses will that lead to in terms of the number of DTC subscribers, if any? Can they continue to grow this product by more than just increasing prices? Because I think ideally and realistically, they need this to become self-sustaining on their own. Right now, it's not quite there. It's gotten to a point where it's basically break even or close to break even, but it's not generating free cash flow just yet. And it's being subsidized by this, by, by this pay for TV pay TV model um, that is shrinking. And if it continues shrinking and it's not offset in a way by the DTC model, it's going to be a problem for them. Um, and that's the long-term thing that they have to think about. How do they make more money from the DTC product? Because they're going to make less and less money from the network side of things, the pay TV side of things. And um, that's, a, that's a question mark for investors. Um, I think the DTC product landscape is a bit diluted right now um they're certainly looking for ways to make more money there they are starting to license some of their older content does that dilute the value of the hmo product the hmo brand in general people do think that naming it H hbo max was diluting the brand so that's why they changed the name to max in general having hbo products on there as one of the offerings on max but don't know if that is a success and don't know if they can continue to grow this area of the business because it needs to grow in order to offset some of the losses on the other side of the business. So with that in mind, why do they need to grow that side? Because they need to continue generating free cash flow as a business because they have a lot of debt problems. Right now they have $47.8 billion in gross debt, 23% of which is due in the next three years. They do have 3.1% 3.1 billion in cash on the balance sheet, which makes their net debt 44.7 billion, which is quite a lot when you consider their market cap is just north of 20 billion. Um, the good thing is that they are generating free cash flow as a business and they're able to pay off this debt at a pretty decent clip. If you look at the 23% that's due in the next three years, that's about 11 billion or so worth of debt. They're going to generate about 5 billion worth of free cash flow in 2023 alone hopefully about the same in 24, hopefully about the same in 25. So do they have the ability to pay down this debt with just their free cash flow and not have to refinance this debt at a higher rate? The good thing about their current debt is that the rate that they have is pretty good. The average cost of debt is 4.6%. And on top of that, the majority of this debt um, is probably 10 years plus out, you know, 50% plus of this debt is 10 years or so or further out and has a pretty good fixed rate, which means as long as they can get a good handle of this debt that's due in the next three to five years, which is maybe 35, 37% of the debt, then they should be in a good spot to really write the business in terms of their debt profile. And I think they do have that ability. They expect their leverage to be below 4x by the end of 2023. That's due to the continued repayment of the debt. They're launching a tender offer for up to 2.7 billion. Um, they're going to pay more as they generate more free cash flow in the next year. And then by the end of 2024, with continued generation of free cash flow, they're going to be below a 3x long term gross leverage, which is their tar target, which is kind of their target. So they're going to be in a pretty good spot. They're not going to be in a spot where they have to refinance this debt at higher rates because rates are higher now. Uh, and as long as their business sustains itself and generates free cash flow for the next couple of years, the debt should not be a huge burden for them. And you can kind of see their outstanding debt in this uh, little sheet that they provided here and where the rates lie. And the rates are pretty good. Even if you look at their you know, 2042 onwards maturities, they're only in that 5% range. And probably if they had to issue 10 year debt at this point, it would be in that 5% plus range. So that's pretty solid debt. Uh, not a huge concern for me as long as the economy holds up and their free cash flow generative power holds up, which seems to be the case right now. Is it going to be the case going forward? Who knows, but seems to be the case right now. So he's really kept the estimates going forward. Um, this is not pro forma data. So 
the data prior to 2022 doesn't reflect the full company. They're not really growing at 24%. That's just not a full year of pro forma data. You can kind of see that the free cash flow is pretty solid and the margins in that 12 to 13% range in the next couple of years are far below where they used to be when this company was just discovery because this data is just discovery data it doesn't include warner media data uh, warner media is a lower margin business simply because they produce higher cost items like actual movies and not just reality tv um, but i think there's some upside to their free cash flow margins today and where they could be on a go forward basis and you can kind of remember that their 2023 goals alone as a combined company were 52 billion dollars with 14 billion dollars in EBITDA or so and the projections now are that they're not really going to reach that by 2027 even but they're still going to generate free cash flow which allows them to pay down that debt and potentially allows them to really right size this business and get rewarded for that with a higher market cap and a higher and a lower free cash flow yield multiple because if you look at their financials we kind of scroll down here what i'm assuming here is that the growth is going to be relatively anemic it's going to get to where they're projecting for 2023 that five billion dollars in cash flow at a 12 percent free cash flow margin and then i'm going to say you know maybe three to two percent growth for the next couple of years and maybe margins that approve by one percent um so why are margins improving by one percent well, part of it is that I think they're going to actually achieve those cost synergies that they talked about during the merger. They already achieved three billion of the three billion they projected, and now they say they are on tar they are on target for five billion plus by the next couple of years. So I think there's some upside there. On top of that, as they pay down this debt, that all flows down to the bottom line via lower interest payments, and that's going to be a good thing in terms of their margins. And yes, there's probably some offset there by the fact that if they do sign a new deal with the writers, if they do sign a deal with the actors, they're probably going to give up a little bit of margin there. But I'm not assuming that the margins are getting back to anywhere close to where they're going to be as a mature company, right? The estimates here are saying that potentially they're going to be in that 14 to 15 percent range. I'm still being pretty conservative there when I look at it. So when you look at it from that perspective and from the perspective of the 2023 estimates and the current market cap of 25.9 billion the market is giving this a 19.5 percent free cash flow multiple based on their market cap now it's not right to look at it from a market cap perspective because of how much debt they have but it's just it's just a way to look at it and you can kind of see how much value they could potentially have if they can unlock more of that market cap by paying down some of their debt so when you look at it from an enterprise value perspective based on the 2023 estimates their estimated uh enterprise value free cash flow yield is 7.2%. So that seems relatively reasonable for a company like this. They are generating a bunch of free cash flow. Uh, they do have a lot of debt overhang, but the market is valuing it pretty properly given where their current debt overhang is. Now, as I look at it on a forward basis, and what I think will happen is that their next couple of years, this could potentially be dead money. The reason I say that is you are going to have a company that is generating significant free cash flow, but they're essentially using all of that free cash flow to do nothing but pay down debt because they have to do that. That debt is maturing soon. It needs to be paid down unless they want to refinance at higher rates. And as a long-term business entity, they probably do not want to do that. They want to pay down that debt as quickly as possible, get back to a relatively reasonable leverage ratio. And when that happens, the market should reward them with a better free cash flow multiple on their market cap. So when I look at this five years out, I'm looking at a completely different company. If that happens, I'm looking at a company that is no longer debt laden or as much as or as debt laden as they are today. And the market cap is rewarding them with a much better multiple on their market cap free cash flow yield. So when I look at it this way, generally I have free cash flow yields that are three to 10% here. I'm nowhere close to that here. I'm looking from nine to 16% on WBD because of their debt issues and the fact that they're still going to have debt in 2027, just less of it. Um, so when I look at it this way, um, the reason I'm looking at it this way, you can kind of think about it in one specific way. When, when you have a $60 billion market cap in 2027, um, the estimate by then is that they're going to have about 24 billion in debt, which leads to an enterprise value of 84 billion, which is not that much different than it is today. However, more of that enterprise value is sitting in the market cap of the company than the debt versus today, 
because they don't have such a debt issue as they do today. And if you look at their enterprise value, freak, whoops. Sorry about that. If you look at their enterprise value, free cash flow yield, it's 7.16% at this market cap, which is right in line with where it is today. So for me, this kind of makes sense. It's always tough to evaluate companies that have such a big part of their enterprise value in debt, but this is one way to do it. And when I look at my scenarios here, I'm saying that that's the best case scenario, which I think is fairly conservative. And then I'm putting 25% weighing on scenarios all the way up to a 13% free cash flow yield. So from an enterprise value yield perspective in 2027, I'm looking at 7 to 9%, whereas today it's trading at 7%. So I'm basically saying this could potentially trade at a worse enterprise value yield than it is today. And I'm still getting a fair value at 1084, which is about 2% higher than it's trading at today at 1066 with a target return of 15%. So why, why am I being so conservative here? Well, there's one main reason, and it's that things could go wrong here, right? Whenever you have a company with a ton of debt like this, you do want to be relatively conservative with how you look at it. Because if their free cash flow generative power that I'm assuming here somehow takes a hit, if there's a big recession and advertising rates fall down, if they start losing enrollment in their DTC uh, products, and then start losing enrollment in their pay TV products, that could be a problem. Um, and if the free cash flow just isn't at 5 billion in the next couple of years, their ability to pay down debt isn't going to be there. And if they have to start refinancing at higher rates and or even issuing shares for whatever reason at low prices to catch up on their debt, that could be a big problem. So one thing you can see is I'm not assuming any buybacks here, and that's because they're gonna use as much of this 28 billion that I assume they're, they're gonna generate just to pay down debt. That is the, their entire thing for the next couple of years. And that's kind of why this investment is a bit murky. It's because if you're paying down debt and you're doing nothing but paying down debt, you're not gonna be able to acquire companies. You're not gonna be investing a ton beyond your standard investments into other growth areas. And that minimizes the ability of this business to grow. And that is a bit of a problem. So that's why I said this could be dead money for a couple of years because the market is not going to react to the stock until it starts seeing that they're able to actually generate free cash flow for a couple of years in a row, potentially expand their margins and start paying down that debt. And then if you look at this company five years from now and their debt is half of what it is today, the market cap is going to be double or more what it is today because the market is going to reward that. They're going to see a completely different company, one that's able to handle their debt, one that's able to pay down their debt. And at that point, they can probably start investing in their business more. They can probably start buying back shares and doing a lot more with that money. So I'm being conservative here because the debt could be a concern for further dilution, further debt, and or potentially bankruptcy if things go really badly. I mean, the chances of bankruptcy here are pretty, pretty low, but anytime you have so much debt, if you're not able to pay it down and you can't borrow more because the company that's lending you money doesn't think you have the ability to pay it back in the future, could be a problem. I just don't think that's the case here. I think they're gonna be able to pay down their debt pretty quickly. They're gonna be able to generate their cash flow. Are there some risks here? Yes, but I think they have the ability to wade through those risks and do it good job of paying down that debt. And if they do that, then this could be a really, really good investment. Now you may say, I need a bit more of a margin of safety here. So maybe 1084 isn't enough for you. Maybe you need 20% lower than that, which takes you to 868. And the stock did trade around nine bucks not too long ago. So maybe it'll get close to that. But to me, today's price seems relatively intriguing. Um, they're already doing some things with the direct to consumer product that are interesting. They're adding sports to max uh, for free at the beginning and then actually charging $10 a month on a go forward basis, which should really improve the revenue on that front. However, my question is, how will the distributors that they work with, whether it's Comcast or Spectrum, how will they react to that? Disney just had a bit of an issue with Spectrum in regards to their negotiations. Will the same happen to Warner Brothers Discovery? Will they have to throw in additional things uh, when it comes to their uh, rate negotiations with any of those uh, distributors. Um, how will the sports negotiations go? Will they be able to retain the NBA? I mean, the NBA is one of the big reasons that a lot of people watch these networks. If they lose it, is that a big deal? 
will the growth of their Mac sports product be anemic if they don't have actual sports there? You know, obviously the NBA is a big sport. They do have the NHL, I believe. They have the NCAA. What else do they have? Do they have the NHL? Um, obviously, they have other channels there. Um, but pay TV is kind of dying down. So the question is always going to be, what's next? What's next? And they're still going to be making movies. Some of these movies will do okay. Theaters are starting to be less and less of a draw. More people are watching things at home. I can't remember the last time I went to a theater. Now, I'm not an everyman by any means, but it's obvious that box office draws are lower. Movies are still a hit. You can kind of see, movies can still be a hit rather. You can kind of see that with Barbie. But what else do they have? They obviously have a lot of good IP on their books. They have DC, they have Harry Potter, um, they have Barbie now and maybe other Mattel stuff. Uh, but where, what's the next big thing? Uh, HBO is doing pretty well as far as I know. You know, Last of Us was a great show. They have some other great shows there as well. Um, obviously, the Game of Thrones series is done, but the, the prequel to it is out there. Um, the strike is putting a bit of a pause on their ability to actually start shooting and writing new things, but that seems to be wrapping up. How will that impact their bottom line? It's probably not going to be huge, but it, it's certainly going to be a bit of a hit to that. I think they can really offset it with other stuff, cost cutting, etc. cetera, um, but it's still going to be a problem. Two, the cost cutting does come uh, at a sacrifice of content, right? They're not really making as much content as they used to is that going to impact their ability to grow their DTC product because they do need to grow it they can't just be at 95.8 million forever if you look at Netflix one of the more profitable streamers they're closer to 200 220 million uh, people globally can max get there or anywhere close to there how much free cash flow can they start generating from this product uh, how much free cash flow can this sports edition add to the product how will that impact their negotiations on the sports side? If suddenly the NBA is looking for rights, not only for pay TV, but also for streaming, are they going to have to pay two separate fees now versus one in the past? Are they going to lose streaming rights, but keep pay TV rights? That's been happening in other sports. So there's a lot of uncertainty there. When they get back to negotiating with distributors, now that they have this direct-to-consumer product that really undercuts one of their primary offerings in sports, um, Will more people start cutting the cord because this is where they make their money right now? Will they be able to offset that with the direct consumer product? And how will that impact their free cash flow? There's a lot of questions here. And that's why you probably need a better return here than the standard 10%. That's why I'm baking in 10, 15%. That's why I'm being more conservative on the uh, free cash flow yield side. If you just kind of go with, well, the current enterprise value is 7.25%. If they pay off their debt as expected, they get a better market cap, free cash flow yield. Their enterprise value at 7.1% is going to be closer to here. And that fair value is about 12.35, which is above today's price. You're expecting a 18.4% return. Um, and the market just opened, so that's why numbers are changing. But you can kind of see where my thought process is here. Um, my thought process is, let me hard code this so it doesn't change on me. My thought process is, you know, they're in dead pay down mode. This stock probably isn't going to move anytime soon. But when it does, when the market realizes, hey, these guys are actually paying down that debt, we should put more valuation into their market cap because right now we're giving this an almost 20% market cap yield. And once that debt starts coming down, that's way too high. That needs to come down closer to, you know, low teens at least or high single digits, which is where I'm pegging it here. And I think five years from now, they can get there. Uh, obviously, the bear thesis would be they're going to lose more pay TV subscribers. They're not going to be able to offset that with direct consumer stuff. Their DC slates are going to fail and continue failing. Even the new uh, leadership won't change that. Their movie slates are mediocre besides Barbie, uh, and that's a problem. Theaters are shrinking, and that's a problem. Um, networks are shrinking, and that's a problem. And direct to consumer is hitting a uh, a point where prices are already hitting high levels. People are complaining that they're getting too expensive. There's too many of them. Will there be consolidation? Who can consolidate? They're not really in a spot to acquire anybody because of their debt burden. So there's going to be a lack of consolidation there. Um, and how can they compete with Disney Plus, with Netflix, with uh, Peacock, with Paramount Plus, all of that other nonsense when prices keep going up and up and up? Are people going to start you know, buying for a month and canceling? How will that impact their actual profitability of the business. Can they hit 
5 billion plus free cash flow that they need to hit to pay down debt. And if not, that is a problem. That is a big problem. So I understand people wanting a bigger margin of safety here. But for me, 1066 uh, seems relatively reasonable. And I might nibble a little bit here. And if it keeps going down lower, which it certainly can in a high rate interest rate environment with this much debt, I might buy a bit more. Is this something I would go all in on? No, because anytime you have this much debt, it could be a problem. Um, but even though their growth is slow, even though the growth is anemic, as long as they can cut those costs and generate free cash flow and pay down debt, eventually the market's going to reward this, but it might take a while. That's the thing you have to keep in mind. This is potentially not going to be something that is going to $20 next month or even in a year. It could just stay around this level for a while until the market digests their ability to pay down debt. And once the market sees that it's doing so and continuing to do so, it could shoot up really quickly. So that would be my thesis that, hey, once they pay down debt, they're going to have a lot more flexibility with their cash. And you're buying it today at a potentially amazing market cap free cash flow yield. Um, it's not so amazing on an enterprise value basis, but as long as that debt gets minimized and the market cap grows as a reward, this could be a good investment. So thanks for watching, guys. As always, guys, remember this video is for informational, educational, and entertainment purposes only. It is not investment advice. Do your own due diligence before making any investment decisions. Please let me know what you thought about the video, what you think about my thoughts. If you like WBD, if you hate it, uh, hit the like button down below if you liked it. And subscribe if you're not a subscriber. And welcome to everybody that is new to the channel and has subscribed. Thanks for watching. Uh, let me know if you guys want me to look at any specific stocks. But until then, have a good rest of your day.